So where did we leave off the last time? We um, were talking, we did the extended release, oxalic acid extended release. We had just wrapped up, I believe, the repeated application mm -hmm. with oxalic acid. Okay. Seven applications, five days apart, where we did not see any control. Well, okay. Let me let the statistician <laughs> say what we found. Yeah. But me as a beekeeper, it didn't work for me. If I'm a beekeeper. Yeah. We did see some control. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is something that I've been, with a lot of this more recent work and with work that we're doing in collaboration with a lot of other researchers, something I'm trying to stress is when we see that a treatment plan prevents varroa increasing versus when a treatment plan actually reduces the number of varroa. So with the repeated applications, what we saw was that colonies that were being hit with the oxalic five days apart for... Um, about seven applications. seven applications indeed and this was you know, middle of summer large brood area so we weren't expecting it to work especially well if at all mm -hmm. what we do see in those colonies is that the varroa population stays where it started those repeated applications are enough to prevent the varroa population growing whereas in the untreated colonies the varroa just keep accelerating and those colonies are going to eventually crash out so in one way Yes, it achieves control in that the varroa aren't increasing, but if you're a beekeeper who's looking at a colony and says, okay, I have too many varroa on these bees, I want to go in and treat them, and then you do that treatment, and then a month later come back after, you know, whatever you've done, and there's the exact same varroa number in there, a lot of beekeepers would not call that control, right? If you're giving them a bunch of chemicals and the varroa level doesn't change, that's not control to most beekeepers. And understanding the difference between those two things I think is really important because both scientists and beekeepers, when they're doing these studies, it's easy to get lost in the kind of numbers that get thrown around when really what you want to know is, okay, if I do this treatment, what am I expecting to happen to my varroa? Are my bees going to live? Yeah. That's the bottom line. And I think that explains why we've seen conflicting information about this re repeated treatment idea here in, in Georgia, especially with a lot of the beekeepers we work with, where for those of them who are just throughout the year hitting them repeatedly with oxalic, if they're starting with low varroa numbers, those varroa numbers never get high. So it looks to them like it's working great. No but for beekeepers... Survive. Yeah. But for beekeepers who are pursuing a more, okay, I'm going to leave the bees, do my alcohol washes or my sugar shakes, and then only treat that apiary once the varroa level's too high, that repeated treatment isn't going to do anything because you've, you've already got too many varroa. And I think that's what's creating some of the surface disagreements between beekeepers talking about what's working for them is if you're doing something what we call prophylactically, so in anticipation as a preventative measure, then that might work for you, but it might not work as a cure. And another, it's also, all, it's depending on the apiary, depending on the hive, depending on, or the, the colony, and more importantly, the timing of the, or time of the year and the population of the mites. Because if we're doing this in early spring, when mite loads are down, and you're doing a repeated application, like Louis mm -hmm. said, you're going to hold, it's going to be static. So we got a static effect, and we held everything at, at the same. But if you're doing this in summer and you've got to bring those mite levers down before your colonies go into fall or start producing your winter bees, you'll need a sidle effect where it's, it's bringing those, those numbers down. It's actually controlling. So basically we're looking at a maintenance treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and repeat again exactly what you did to achieve that maintenance. So we went in with oxalic acid with the vaporizer and we oxalic them... Um, seven applications, five days apart. And we went through, we, we kept pushing it because we were wanting to see at, at, at what point would we start noticing a decrease, and we never did. But like Lewis was saying, everything held steady. What month what, what months was that? Uh, July, August. August, so. Yeah. August. Yeah. Okay. It was some, it was in. Summer. And the mite loads when we started were relatively high. So we yeah. weren't coming in with an alcohol wash of one mite per hundred bees. No. Yeah. You know, so we had substantial okay. mites. And that's, see, and that's where, where we as beekeepers and you, Bob, 
with your with these podcasts you need to educate the beekeepers that it's it's so much about timing um, and every colony is going to be different and you can't treat you know every colony the same uh, depending on when did that colony did they start that colony that year with a package or did they start with a nuke um, did they start it last year did they catch a swarm I mean it's there's so many factors that come into play when we're dealing with Varroa and the whole Varroa life cycle and the relationship between the mite and the bees and the brood and all of that, um, it's not clean and easy. And it's not just where we could just drop something in and it walk away. Well, you know, we did uh, several uh, solid visualizations this winter and because of the warm December, we had some colonies that never went completely broodless. Yeah. So normally we think, oh, we'll do two treatments and we're good to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure that's going to work this year. Well, and that's something also that we didn't mention, is that in this repeated study, uh, it, we, had, we had a lot of brood. I mean, it was, yeah. we did mention that. Lots of brood. So, a lot of mites are in the cat brood, and they're not being exposed to the oxalic. And people say, well, if you keep repeating over and over, at some point, every mite in that colony is going to be exposed to oxalic, and that's just not that's true. That's simply not true. Because yeah. they're coming, they're emerging, and they're entering cells on all different time frames. But Lewis, it looks really good on paper. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, that's beekeeping looks really good on paper. Because well, <laughs> people assume everybody, all the mites are emerging, yeah. and then they're all going in the cells. Mites don't they? have wristwatches. Yeah. Right? They're not saying, oh, it's been five days, time for me to hop into a new yeah. cell. That's not how yeah. nature works. You know, we talk about things. You know, average lifespans or average this or average that, but the average is the important thing there. Mm. There's always going to be, yeah. you know, individuals at the tail ends of the distribution that makes things like yeah. this a bit.